when the guy came to put in the pipes for the radiator, he used something I'd imagine was a chainsaw. So the floor was destroyed. The bit, if I'd pulled the carpet back day one another inch, right. I would have seen the problem, but I didn't. I put it back to protect the floor. So Hello and welcome to the Built Around You podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you build, renovate or upgrade your home. Why is building a home so complex and stressful? Why do building projects run over time and budget? Welcome to the podcast built around you. Today we have a very special show. We have uh, an old friend of mine, um, Stephen McGovern. He is a BER consultant, uh, full disclosure. He does a lot of BER work with, with, with me at KMC Homes. Um, I find him an endless uh, fountain of, of knowledge, particularly on the, um, on the energy front. Um, Stephen has renovated his own house, which is an end of terrace house in uh, McCurtain Villas um, on College Road in Cork City. And he has a wonderful story to share there. So uh, hello, Stephen, and welcome to the show. Good afternoon, Karen. How are you doing? I'm Glad very good. I'm very good. Board. Thank you. Uh, so, Stephen, tell me a little bit about you, your backstory, your, 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 a bit of your history, um, uh, so we can see where, where your story comes from and how it's driving you to, uh, or dr drove you to renovate your home. Yeah, well, I uh, am first of all, I'm from West Cavan, uh, up in the hills up there in a place, I suppose, if you're Cork uh, listeners, you'd be more familiar with uh, maybe like Balangiri. It's that kind of landscape. It's kind of mountainous kind of place where people run away f from people too, you know, like the, the O'Leary's ran away up there many years ago. The McGovern's ran into the hills of West Cavan away from McCarthy's or some <laughs> such foe, I suppose. And uh, so I went to college. Oh, like, I suppose big interest in construction always in our family. All my family are builders, you know, immigrate immigrants from that part of the world. So I would have, you know, grown up with with uncles and father dropping in and out of London, New York. Building was a big part of the fam, big part of the part of the background there. So we we built everything ourselves. You know, it was we just got out the cement mixer and got it done. You know, so. I always had that interest and I went to study in Sligo Regional Technical College as it was at the time. I came to kind of got to a diploma level. I was going to take a year off. So I decided to go off to Europe and travel and work. Came back in 2005 back to Ireland. I suppose uh, should the reason for that, I suppose, is I met a Cork woman over there and uh, we had a kid and, you know, we just decided we'd come back. So. And I wanted to, uh, I suppose, do my own thing, you know. So at the time, became very interested in the whole energy sec sector, you know, being very aware of kind of global warming issues and climate change from long before it was popular. So I started thinking, look, can I work in the industry that's quite cutthroat, but do something that I can kind of come home in the evening and say, well, look, at you know, maybe I'm doing something. So that sort of drove me into that industry. I started doing BR assessments, probably ran into you around that time and started, you know, started building a business out of that for myself. So you you had your you had done various courses in construction management. You had your BR assessment um, uh, qualification and you and your wife and child had settled back in Cork mm. and it came time to find a house. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Yeah, so uh, um, in the meantime, another child came along as well. So we definitely needed more space. So anyway, yeah, found a house, very old, 1930s, um, fine houses. They were built quite well at the time in Cork City, very close to the city centre, uh, but in need of, you know, a lot of modernisation, you know, in terms of scale and everything like that. So lo lovely old house, mm. beautiful character, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but literally a shell. Yeah, exactly. And people are familiar with the area. This brick is what I have, actually, <laughs> halfway up the house. And then it's, it's that is that kind of thing. So that's, you know, that that posed problems in terms of getting the insulation right on it. Now, they built a couple of estates around Cork at the time uh, with uh, two layers of brick. So you had a brick outer layer and a brick inner layer. So you had a cavity in there. God, it was never rare. Yeah, it was, it was unusual. Yeah, especially for 1930s. Oh my God. Now, it was a, I think it was a British military design that we inherited at the start of the state. Uh, the, uh, another, uh, yeah. another positive foreign <laughs> influence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, and it was about keeping dampness from the outer layer to the inner layer. It was never about insulation or anything like that course, that we yeah. think about today. So I got left with with that. So that was that was it. So we we basically had the front wall and the side wall of the house and the rest was going to go. You know, so we 
we're going to continue that house out the back, put a kitchen on it. We had to get planning permission for that, obviously, because it was, you know, coming close to the neighbours and all this kind of stuff. We had to alter that plan from what we had hoped to. We had to downscale the upper floor. So we think we went... Because of planning? Because of planning and just, you know, getting on with your neighbours and making sure everybody was happy with it, you know. So uh, before you... Lodge for planning and all that. Did you did you live in the house first, or are you straight no, away just no? It got was planning? it was need and gutting completely. Okay. It was you know it. I think it was lying uh, for a long time on, in in probate and all these kind of things. Yeah. And a, an old man had lived there before, and it had kind of fallen into disrepair anyway. You know, so it was yeah. it was need and gutting. So it lay empty for a long time before we moved into it. Okay, so you you, you took on an architect to, to do plans, or, or what did you do? Yes, I am lucky enough to have in my family an architect architectural technologist who done up some plans for us. It was quite simple because, you know, we didn't have much to do. You know, we've done some nice design work at the back to get light into it. Mm. But obviously his input was huge in terms of just getting plans together for planning permission and that. So family member uh, slash architect, uh, quite low cost type of <laughs> arrangement. And the, the, that low cost arrangement followed right through to the day okay, we moved in. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. you got plans done and... Th- th- you had to scale back a little bit. Did that, be, that happen because like a further information on the planning or, or how did that? How did yeah, it was it was a request uh, made by planning that we wouldn't um, go uh, double height both floors back. So we stepped it in. It created a nice little light well in the yeah. in the kitchen. Actually, it was a nice It ended up being a design. We were happier. We lost a bedroom. Yeah, we lost our spare room. So uh, but at the same time, it still fulfilled the needs of the family. Uh, and it did, it, it had improved the design of the house, really. You was know. this from like an overshadowing point of view to next door? Yes, I guess yeah. that's that would be the implication. It would have looked, I guess, like a big kind of hulking extension, whereas now when you stepped it, it became a kind of more... So obviously light was a, was a problem. And were you able uh, to add a roof light then on your ground floor? Yes. Yeah. So it brought a lot of light into the kitchen area with this light and became a design feature. We, we sloped it... Uh, uh, back away from the house up you know so it became a kind of it's a design feature of the house now that we're very happy with yeah because we we had a we had a house in uh, in black rock and in, in cork city um the, the, until reasonably recently and like you we went for planning for quite an elaborate um design probably around the same similar time to your own i'd say mm. um quite elaborate design with two story and everything else mm. and the planners came back with a further information request which mm. generally means they're broadly okay with where you're going but there are things that they're not quite happy with mm. um and they asked us to uh, they, they said we were overshadowing the neighbors uh, mm. light because you've an, you've an, you've you've a right to light mm. as, as an individual uh, as a property owner and um, so we had to scale it back like, like you said there as well but again we because we scaled it back it did make the design look nicer we lost a bit of space clearly in the first mm. floor and like you we were able to add a roof light on the ground floor to bring extra light so there mm. are positives and negatives that you, there can, was, yeah. you can use and all that yeah, yeah. So you scaled back your design mm-hmm. and you got planning handy enough then? We got our planning uh, to go ahead uh, and we basically employed different uh, trades all the way through it. And what was access like? Had you good access? I, I know from yeah. building many extensions that the one heartache, well the two heartaches are mm-hmm. number one, the access to the, the site generally mm-hmm. at the back where a lot, lot of the work happens. And of course, tying into the existing building yeah, is another hard yeah. day. Tell no, end that. of terrace, we're lucky that way. It did come with a 30 metre garden from the back wall to the next neighbouring property. And on the side of the house, we had we have about 2.5 metres wide side passage. Now, some of that is gar- is kind of raised, gar- um, what would you call it, garden type thing. But you could still get the three ton digger, which was the, the oh, important one. You know, the way they can fold up their legs a little bit and in they come. And then, you know, so we did have access, you know, so mini dumpers and all that kind of stuff that obviously Great. made things. And it was kind of stepped. Our house is raised. So there's a natural kind of thing for if you wanted to put a truck in to unload, get rid of topsoil or whatever. That helped as well, you know. But so it was tight. You know, it was a tight site. But I know mid terrace come going through doors with wheelbarrows yeah. and things like that. We didn't have all that. That adds to a lot to cost, as I know well. And were you on the tools yourself or just on the shovel and oh, sweeping up at night? Absolutely. Uh, every, everything that could be done. I suppose one thing that I had learned about this uh, whole industry is that when you go looking for prices, what the builder is afraid of is what he doesn't know. You know, So I would try to de-risk everything as much as could. So I would say I will take responsibility for 
digging out the side of that bank because I'll take the hit if there's a rock there and it ends up taking you two weeks when it should have taken you a day, you know. And so I kind of brought that approach through everything, you know, and it was also, it was, it was late nights cleaning up, making sure everything was ready. And I, you know, and, you know, as a project manager, uh, you, that's how you start to notice things as well. You're like, oh, right, we haven't done this or we haven't, this won't be ready at the same time that this guy needs it, you know. It's all that kind of, fitting the project together and getting things to run smoothly which is easy if it's one company because you just send the guy somewhere else for the day or the girl somewhere else for the day but uh, you know when you're when you've got trades coming on site everything has to be ready for them so you know it was very much hands on you know there was trenches dug through for pipes all that kind of stuff you know and a, a very enthusiastic I think four year old at the time holding torches for me and everything you know so I mean there, there's, but, a, there's no substitute for being on site nothing like as it, yeah. much yeah. As, yeah. as you had I mean I, I know we, we renovated a house last year which again I know you were involved in mm-hmm. um, and because it was on a West Cork I was only able to call down once a week maybe twice a week and the house was going at full tilt mm-hmm. and even though I was on the phone to the, the foreman here there and everywhere and uh, we, we still like every few days the house had moved well on from where we thought it would be and mm-hmm. you're kind of going oh god I wish I'd seen this a little bit earlier I yeah. could have got in around yeah. a bit more so I can certainly uh, see yeah. the value that it would have been for yeah. you looking at all the things and you get the time to scratch your head and go well the plumber's coming tomorrow but this isn't quite ready for him yeah. so look I better do it myself or let the plumber know it's going to be a day later exactly. so or, or even value. to get another trade like I would have had labourers to hand you know that could bring in to do a day's work but they need time and planning so you're there at five in the morning as soon as it's bright you know as soon as whatever we've done it during the summer mainly and you know you're there again at five in the afternoon you're there till 10 o'clock at night getting it all so it was it was busy so your it social was, life was took, a, took a major social hit social life took a major hit the only good thing about it was I did involve a lot of we, we set up a, a whatsapp group called the free labour movement <laughs> so I had to take them to the to the Abbey Tavern as our local give them a plug there <laughs> okay. quite regularly for pizzas and beers so you know there was you know involved family was involved friends was involved you know so from that point of view it was quite enjoyable and they're all coming back to me for these favours in return now which is the problem <laughs> <laughs> of course I wanted the end product to be you know not a passive house but something that was going to be touching the A2 A3 rating and I, I'm talking about something that's you know not costing me more than 500 euros a year to heat that kind of region I wanted because I was working in this so I wanted that kind of standard of house so um, the first thing that we we let go of was finishes right finishes can be finished at any time you know you know so if your budget right, is yeah. there it's all the stuff you can't see you can always so change the kitchen you can change the kitchen you know you can get the 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 the, the lower cheap cheaper kitchen in for a couple of years it'll do you fine and then you'll have a proper budget and you've lived in the house a little bit then you'll understand what works a little bit better and your kids will be older and they won't be trashing the kitchen exactly the, so they the got bites. to trash the older the ikea one uh, and then we would get the <laughs> we get the other one in uh, yeah. that, that's a still ongoing project as well we're five years in it this week i think yeah, yeah, so, so uh, that's that was the that was the deal done with herself. That's but you wanted to get kitchen, the, so. the basics. Yeah. So the, what's underground? Exactly. What's in the walls? What's in the attic? The you insulation. Want to right. You know all the stuff you can see. Getting that correct. Getting the heating system correct. Getting all that kind of kind of uh, systems. You know properly. So you know our budget was. I was not taking any shortcuts in any of that. You okay. Know? So that was one thing. So obviously there was an X amount of money. There was another loan achieved. But we were very much then relying on a lot of that insulation cost. Then we were relying on this pilot scheme, deep retrofit home scheme. Okay. That it would actually pay out. So yeah, it was, was a lot of balancing and making sure that was going okay. to be okay. Tell us a little bit about that scheme because oh, yeah. clearly you are a BR consultant. You're mm-hmm. an expert in all this. A lot of our listeners and viewers will be really interested in this because they might be starting a big deep re- retrofit or even okay. some level of energy, energy yeah. upgrade on their own home. Tell us a little bit about that. So at that time, it was a pilot scheme and it was whatever the cost of an energy upgrade, you got 50% of it. So that was fantastic, you know. So that was that scheme doesn't exist uh as generous at the moment they've standardized it now and it's called the one-stop shop and you get x amount so your house is categorized as mid-terrace end terrace detached apartment etc set amount of money for set amount of measures external wall insulation gets x cavity wall gets y in end of terrace mid-terrace you know so it's very standardized that means that there's no more to and froing from saei and a contractor it's you know day one 
exactly what you're going to get. You and you know? can see all this on the SEI website? Yeah, that's all on the SEI website. They go into the one-stop shop, go into the, the, the warmer homes, the whole, ener- the whole up energy upgrade section, and you've got three options. Warmer home scheme, which is where the government come in and pay everything. Individual grant measures, which is where you can go in and get an individual grant for your heat pump or your attic insulation or whatever. And then the third one is the one-stop shop system that, okay. that, that co- that's in where you, you, know, you hand the whole project over to one contractor, hopefully, They'll, well, one stop shop, it has to be. They come in and they organize everything, the grant, they come in, they provide a consultant like myself who comes in and basically uh, sets out what the roadmap to getting this house to a very efficient, cost optimal, efficient level is. And uh, then they can give you a pricing document and they already know what the grant is because it's now set, set amounts. So it's, it's quite generous, you know, as it's uh, average 22,000 up to 32,000 of grant aid available for these. What you're ending up with is what's the best heating system that can heat this house is your end goal. So you're starting at the end. At the moment, the best system is generally an air source heat pump or air to water heat pump. That's the most efficient method we have in this country at the moment that I can see uh, that will heat your house. Yeah, I would um, agree. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a fantastic system. Yeah. I, have it, I have it myself yeah. as well. But uh, of course, as we know, then you start introducing that you have to have an extremely efficient yes. um, envelope then yeah. so that the little bit of heat, the very efficient heat that you generate, you, you keep. Exactly, because it's a low temperature system. So as your, 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 your boiler systems tend to be water going around your house at 70 degrees temperature, that means that there's more heat in that water. So it allows for more drafts and more poor insulation. It'll keep up with it. But a low temperature system won't. As I pull back my, my carpet that I inherited and found beautiful timber floor so okay. i'm like okay here's a a great one. but it's a problem how am i going to deal with it? so i just put the carpet back and i said i'm going to deal with that later in the meantime i'm thinking about my my extension floor slab so i'm going all right i i won't go it under floor heating because half of my house is going to have to have radiators because of this floor so i put radiators in in so uh yeah so uh, under floor heating wasn't the first thing that, that came to mind the next thing I would have had to look at was the walls of the house. So we had this, as I said, this brick uh, cavity. And uh, that was a, a problem because the cavity only contained 80 millimetres of space. So that wasn't going to be enough insulation, really, to get to the standard where we wanted to go. It was going to be a massive help to me, but it wasn't going to get me there. So then I was going to have to introduce internal insulation along with that, really. Okay. And internal because I wasn't going to cover this lovely brick with with you know external wall insulation so you're like going do we do the top half one way and the bottom half another way so we said no the cavity really bailed us out of it because it broke thermal bridges where that's where you can't get insulation into places you'll get the cold bridging from one side to the other and it also created an air tightness uh, sort of layer for me so when we went with the internal insulation um, that was adding the internal insulation and what we got in the cavity was able to get us to the okay. U value we required. Um, could I ask you a little bit more about the floors? Because like you're putting mm. a new floor into the extension um, mm. and obviously when you're pouring new concrete, you're thinking, oh, it wouldn't be lovely to have underfloor heating. Yeah. You have the old floors in the house, which I, given that you've old timbers, I'm guessing, are these are these on, on, on joists and a ventilated cavity underneath? Yeah, so down the centre of the house, uh, my house, if you could imagine, it, it sort of turns sideways and stuck on the end of the row. So the door is in the middle of the house at the end of the house, that makes sense. So to the left was the sitting room. It was suspended timber floor with a vent, an air brick, all that kind of thing. And then in the centre strip was all, you know, 1930s concrete, you know, under the stairs, little kitchen area. Yeah. And now I've got my new slab of so, concrete so, behind so, it. So my biggest question here is you have the old, we know with the new floor, you have loads of options. Mm. And with the old floor, you're putting in radiators Mm. Um, you also have questions on uh, air tightness. You also have questions on how mm. to insulate it. How, yeah. how did you work through all that? So my biggest issue would have been the air tightness there in that situation. So um, I'll tell you what I didn't do. <laughs> what my plan was to lift the floorboards, uh, net out uh, an area between the boards, put insulation between them, uh, a breathable type insulation, and then put an air tightness membrane down and then put my... 1930s floorboards back as if nothing had ever happened. That's not what happened, you know. So uh, when we pulled the carpet back fully, we discovered that when the existing radiator, so this house wouldn't wouldn't have had central heating day one, it was retrofitted into it. When the guy came to put in the pipes for the radiator, he used something I'd imagine was a chainsaw 
to cut it. So, they, so the floor yeah. was destroyed. The bit, if I'd pulled the carpet back day one another inch, right. I would have seen the problem, but I didn't. I put it back to protect the floor. So anyway, what happened? The floor came out. I ended up with 150 mil of insulation under that floor and still radiators. So yeah, mm. so that's one thing that would have changed, obviously. I would have had the option of underfloor heating throughout the house, which would have been better. It would have meant my, my, my heat pump would be running at a lower flow temperature, which equals more efficiency at okay. the end of the day. Okay. But look, the, these things happen. These things happen, yeah. And tell me, but your attic would have been a bit more straightforward then, I guess? Uh, not really. Uh, the new part, yes. Uh, the older part had these sloping ceilings, you know, the attic kind of stepped okay. up into the attic. So that, there, look, at the, because we were cutting the thing anyway, that wasn't a problem. We pulled everything down. Um, one. Uh, so what you generally do with them, you generally end up with something like a three inch or a four inch uh, a rafter in these situations. These were three. So not enough room to get, not a lot of room to get insulation in there. But we did, we let, left an air vent, an air cavity behind it to allow the roof to continue to breathe and put uh, insulation between the rafters and then an insulated slab over it. And very importantly, before we put the insulated slab air tightness membrane that's the huge thing like these newly plastered ceilings are still leaking air at a huge amount it, it seems improbable when you look at it to think it is but you know if you stand up against in a dormer house on a windy day you can feel the air coming through that plaster you know so that's that's a big thing for people don't save the 100 or 200 euros on that it's very important put on that air tightness membrane and tell me, have you a heat recovery system as well then? No, we went with demand control ventilation. Okay. So heat recovery would have been tough to retrofit into a house like that because it means there's a pipe to and from every room in the house. Not impossible, uh, but uh, we went with demand control ventilation. So we used uh, the air echo system, which means that in every habitable room, we have a little vent that opens and closes as the humidity levels in that room require it to. And there's no wires or batteries or anything involved in this. It just opens and it's a nylon strip that reacts to humidity in the air and opens and closes it. So that means there's some element of mechanical control on how much ventilation has been allowed into the house. And then there's a very effective centralized mechanical extract system, which is a, a fan in the attic, which is piped to every wet room. So your showers, your utilities. And there's sensors in them rooms, so when you come in, it comes on. And they're very, they're, they're, they're really efficient and good at taking out all the steam. So when you've had your shower, you should be able to see your, so you shouldn't be coming out into a room full of smokes. Your extraction system's not working properly if there's okay. steam in the room of any significance. So you have, you have a great litmus test at the end of the shower. <laughs> yeah, 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 it, yeah, yeah. Whether you like yeah. it or not, you should be able to see yourself what's there. And that's, 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 that's a good one. People often ask the question, why are we spending all this money on air tightness membranes and then we're adding ventilation systems? I mean, why don't we just forget the air tightness system and forget the ventilation system yep. and just drive on as we did before? Love this question. My favorite question. <laughs> because you can't control it. You have no control over the elements, the temperature, the wind speed outside is controlling your ventilation. And you don't want that. You want to bring it in to have it controllable and the reason why the open and close vents the natural ventilation don't work is because humans can close them so take away the human control when you're putting in your demand control ventilation or similarly they test the airflow through that so they go okay this is taking x amount of cubes of air out of this house that's unfortunate that's heat that's lost but this is important to keep people healthy inside in the house but now we've controlled that so we have control over it. We can adjust it if we want. If we think there's too much air or if it's still too stuffy, we can draw more air out of the house. You're drawing more heat out of the house, but it's important to have a balance between what's healthy and what's uh, efficient, you know. OK, so so you've done all these measures. You have an air to water system with yep. reds. You have uh, you have insulated all your ground floor, mm -hmm. uh, new and old. You have pumped your 80 mil cavity between the brick yep you have a dry lining board on the inside which you've carefully measured to, to balance mm -hmm. the balance of books there uh, and you have your your insulated slabs and rigid and whatever in between your your rafters in in the yep. attic um so i have to ask you mm, yeah. how did your br test go at the end i ended up just outside of an a3 rating so it was 57 kilowatt hours per meter squared. So f under 50 is A2. So that's a 1930s house. Started as a G, started as a G and ended up there, you know. And you're, you're talking about, you know, spending something in the region of 120,000. And that's including the extension. 
to get it to that level. That is amazing, you know? yeah. And that's obviously, we got a nice grant from SEI, half of the energy, you know, a lot of, you know, project management, cost saved, obviously, you know, yeah. calling in favours there and there and yeah. everywhere. So it would have been built quite cheaply. But yeah, so we ended up there. So I have a brand new smart meter there. And last night I checked to see how many kilowatts have I used in the last five years. This house is costing 500 euros a year to heat and hot water. That's incredible. Yeah. One quick question, because we, we didn't actually touch on this. What kind of windows do you fit? So I went for a really good quality double glazed. And I, at the time, was looking at the price difference between what I considered really good quality triple glaze and really good quality double glazed. The really bad quality triple glaze was quite closely in cost to the really good double glazed. So I went with the really good double glazed instead of what I thought was poorer triple glazed, you know. And so, well, you, you've you've got an excellent um, BR result, um, given that you have been very thrifty in clearly the way you set up the project. But I mean, you didn't automatically default to heat recovery. You didn't automatically default to triple glaze. So I, I, I'm impressed mm. with that because like you and I deal regularly mm. on the phone and everything else about different projects. And you know me, I'm all, I always have my finger on the budget mm. uh, the whole time. And you're saying, look, we need to do this. And I go, look, that's great, but it's going to cost more money. How can we also get the same BR mm. result without uh, writing another check for five grand? Mm. And there's a bit of over and back and heated debates that eventually we get there, thank God. Um, but um, if you were to do it all again? Yeah, two things, I suppose. Um, uh, one would have been the underfloor heating. Obviously, I would have gone with underfloor if I if I could have. Um, uh, so it was sort of a, a rash decision, I guess, in terms of getting the project going. Uh, I would definitely have gone with the underfloor throughout the house. And um, I suppose I'd, I'd like to have gone with more natural materials if I had more budget and my knowledge that I have now that I didn't have five years ago. I would, I would like to explore the use of more natural materials instead of this PIR board. Uh, you know, use a more breathable material for the structure in certain houses. And then I suppose other information that's coming to light now is questions over some of these materials and how they perform over time. Like they perform s s fantastically on the day they do the test in the NSAI test center. But if you test them again in 20 years, the information that's coming out about some of these products is not very comforting, you know, for somebody who put a lot of this into his house, you know, so I suppose that's another aspect of it. And tell me more about these regulations that are coming out next year. So, yeah, so that's going to be a big thing. We're going to see a tightening on the, uh, the regulations as they were. So you're going to find me coming back to you more next year uh, with your new designs, Kieran, and saying, this is really tight. This is really tight. You know, we need, you need, we need not, not so much that they really want us to up um, the uh, insulation types and materials and stuff but I think the tightening up on air tightness and that kind of thing so the workmanship end of it's definitely going to come into it but which, is, which is great because great. Um, I mean, all our houses will be a lot more efficient but mm. at the same time it will cost more mm. and we're all suffering hugely from inflated building costs yeah. a, along with every other inflation aspect mm. um, that we're suffering from at the moment as well so there's a lot of good but there's a lot of uh, a lot of difficulty for people who are already under financial yeah. pressure with, with their building projects anyway um, from my point of view when it comes to um, energy saving devices and um, and insulation and air tightness levels and all that there are they are a fantastic investment because they do cost a lot of money it's it's a one off cost for mm. um, reduced or all but eliminated heating bills for the rest of your lifetime please god so um, it's a great investment and it's a it's a guaranteed return i mean you, you invest in the stock market you may or may not win or lose money or make or lose money but um but if you invest in good quality insulation in good quality air tightness a good quality builder who, who good quality um workmanship, workmanship yeah. and attention to detail and your your the best heating system you can afford uh, it is a tremendous investment mm. okay well you you're cert you're certainly painting a picture of uh, of uh, a a wonderful story I'd, I'd love to I've never actually seen your house I was called down sometime oh. and see all the hard work you've done um, I'm intrigued to see the, the beautiful old red brick because like mm. you were talking there about a cavity that you pumped 
um, back and the house was built back in the 1930s. I've mm-hmm. never seen a cavity in a house any younger than built in the 1970s, I'd say, in the yeah. city. So yeah, I was, yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated to hear that and, yeah. and the, the, the lineage of it from, from the, uh, the original design. Um, you've managed to clearly embrace the character of, of the house. Um, you've brought all your knowledge and experience, bringing all the modern technologies um, in terms of uh, ventilation and insulation without going crazy. I mean, someone of your background could easily start just writing checks straight away on the on the triple glaze and straight away on the full mm-hmm. heat recovery. But you didn't because you're watching the, the wallet and the, yeah. the budget as well, which, which of course, I'm all, I'm all for. And you still drove an excellent BER rating at the end of it. Um, and, and there's more to come with your photovoltaic mm-hmm. when, when the budget loads. So... Um, so look, I'd love to see the house one time. Um, You're welcome. Kettle's always on. So, uh, and, and thank you very much for joining us today. Yep. I really Pleasure. enjoyed our conversation. I Pleasure. hope our listeners learned a lot about how to retrofit an old house um, and how to get the grants. Very importantly, I know when I was re- when I was retrofitting my own house last year, um, or even a year before when I spoke to you first, it was one of the best phone calls I ever made. I, I rang you and I said, look, I'm going to need you for a BR assessment. And you said, make sure you get the deep retrofit grant. And all of a sudden I saved myself a, a nice bit of money. So it was one of the best mm. phone calls they made on the job. Um, so thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, wishing you the very best. Dying to see your house. And uh, again, thank you for joining us today. All right, Karen, thank you. So that was Stephen McGovern, a good friend of mine, a BR consultant in Cork, serving most of Ireland, I believe. Um, so uh, I highly recommend uh, you speaking with Stephen, uh, the Cork Energy Rating Company. Um, if you're thinking of doing any any energy upgrades to your house or if you're thinking of building a new house, he is a wealth of information and you will you will come away from the phone call being an expert on a house renovation and uh, and new energy upgrades uh, very quickly as, as I have. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, remember, we're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts. So if you're enjoying this podcast, please give us a star rating wherever you get your podcast because it really helps the podcast. Um, and we have another exciting podcast coming for you next Sunday at 8pm so make sure to stay tuned and speak to you then. Mm-hmm.